nice to be back. Second night. This time for a different topic. Although it really does also, again, touch on, just as last night's talk was on secession, which is a type of decentralization of political power. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a related topic, which is the problem of decentralizing military power specifically within a confederation or a regime itself. And part of how I got on this topic was whenever I would write on the topic of gun rights, gun ownership rights in the United States, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the Second Amendment. Second Amendment this, Second Amendment that. We don't need to talk about any of the details of what's behind gun ownership. We've got the Second Amendment, and that's, that's good enough for me. Uh, but of course, it occurred to me, we have a very international audience uh, that reads uh, the Mises Institute website. And I thought, well, how do I explain why private ownership and decentralized ownership of weapons is a good thing without using the Second Amendment? Because if you're just talking about the U.S. Bill of Rights, well, a non-American would be like, okay, well, what does that have to do with me? You have to explain then what are the principles at work here that are behind the amendment? Why does the amendment exist and for what reason? And so I started looking then in to the, the philosophical and ideological foundations behind the amendment and the idea of private ownership. And private ownership is simply a type of decentralizing. It's a way to decentralize the ownership of the means of coercion, right? Uh, so you'll remember if, uh, if, if you studied um, Max Weber, state building, the history of the state, that sort of thing, the definition of the state is an organization that within a specific territory has a monopoly on the means of coercion. And it's the traditional definition of what a state is. A uh, key important factor is there's this means of coercion that is usually the use of weaponry and, and violence. Uh, how do we employ that? Uh, either to protect ourselves or to enforce provisions, uh, forcing other people to do things, enforce laws. And some organization has a monopoly on it. And if you have a monopoly on it, you're a state. So the question is, well, can we weaken a state's monopoly by weakening its, or can we weaken a state's power by weakening its monopoly on the means of coercion? And that's precisely what the Second Amendment is supposed to do. It's supposed to weaken the power of the central state in the United States, that is the federal government, by uh, prohibiting it from limiting and monopolizing for itself the complete control over the means of coercion that is uh, as expressed in the ownership of arms uh, of a variety of different types. So I, I wanted to really look at the, the historical and ideological evolution here so that I could really think more systematically and in terms of more universal concepts rather than just, well, there's this U.S. Constitution and has a text in here and that's, that should be sufficient for us. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to try and examine for you the, the, the reasoning that this, this amendment exists and what the thinking was behind it and how we could potentially even recapture then the, the intended original purpose of the amendment, which is to decentralize state power. So just as to start off, we can look at what the Second Amendment is. It's, it's the Second Amendment specifically to the U.S., Bill of Rights, which just means the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. And so the second one that they're, they're writing, this is after the adoption of the Constitution in 1787, 1788, and the current Constitution, not to be confused with the previous one, the Articles of Confederation, which we'll mention a little bit, the current Constitution, and a couple of years later, uh, they added some additional amendments. This was partly to placate um, some people who had opposed the adoption of the new constitution, which they felt was insufficiently protective of certain rights. And so the second one simply reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So normally when you talk about this with the public and, and people in terms of uh, what, what modern public policy is, they tend to fixate just on the last couple of clauses there. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. You hear much less about what the first couple of 
clauses here, which is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. That is, a militia is necessary to the security of the free state. What do they mean by that? Now, people who are against gun ownership will argue that, well, what it means is that only uh, gun ownership should be limited only to membership in these official militia groups. Uh, I would argue that is not the proper interpretation. However, we do need to note and grant here that they are speaking in specific terms of what a militia is. They are thinking of actual organized groups separate from the federal government that has access to weaponry, advanced weaponry even, and are organized along lines, uh, in many cases approved of by state and local governments. And there are two images of the militia that we'll look at. There's this idea of the unorganized militia, which are just people who own guns in their own homes and they can be called forth to, to, uh, to join the militia in times of civil unrest. But it was also imagined that there will, would be some sort of locally controlled uh, state or local militia that did not answer to the federal government, that there would be trained groups of people that had access to firearms and, and bigger weapons than that even, who uh, would also just be uh, not just a loosely knit group of people who happen to have weapons, but were a more institutional sort of organization. And they imagined both of those groups then existing. And the purpose then was to offer a counterbalance against the central government, which had a very uh, large amount of control over a large number of weapons. The idea was, okay, we need some local people who could maybe protect us from the central government in case it becomes excessively powerful and aggressive. So that's the overall issue. Let's look then at at where that comes from, where those ideas uh, originally formed just to get a sense of what's behind all of this. Uh, And I would note that if this is our vision for what the Second Amendment was, if this was their vision for what the Second Amendment should be, a large number of militia groups, either uh, institutionalized or more casually composed of private gun owners, then that vision has failed, that it has fallen out of usage, that it is no longer employed as a meaningful balance against federal control of the means of coercion. Now, with so many things related to the Bill of Rights, to the American Revolution, to the American ideas of rights, you have to look beyond the revolution into the past. You have to look to the English civil wars of the 17th century, because so much of what the American revolutionaries thought in terms of what are their rights, how do they stand up for their rights, we can trace back directly to uh, the English civil wars in uh, the 1600s, in the mid-17th century. And this was a time where you had groups that started to advocate for amendments like what we now call the Fifth Amendment, which is the right to remain silent. Why did Why was that an issue? Well, during the period of the English Civil Wars and the period leading up to it, uh, they would torture people to get them to confess things and say things. And But if you have a right to not say anything, then torture doesn't work uh, within a legal setting nearly as well. So it, this all came to a head in the period leading up to the English Civil Wars, this period of uh, when English kings attempted to become absolutist kings more on a French model. Uh, and and fancied themselves as absolute monarchs that uh, the the English didn't really go for uh, nearly as much. So the civil wars resulted, uh, and you had some groups, the, perhaps the most libertarian of which, the most classical liberal of which, and one of the earliest examples of classical liberalism uh, as a functioning group would be a group called the Levelers. And these were radical liberals by today's standards, for sure. And... Uh, they themselves in the 1640s, as uh, as absolutism uh, is clearly an issue in England, and as the, the English Civil Wars are heating up, the levelers are calling for a decentralized militia system in England, the whole point of which was to lessen the power of the king in domestic affairs. And as one historian of the levelers writes, uh, in May 1649, the levelers proposed that armed forces were to be raised strictly by local divisions and officered by men elected locally. Only the general officers were to be appointed by parliament. John Wildman was to express similar views in more specifically Republican terms in the 1650s, 
opposing, quote-unquote, mercenary armies in favor of the people being, quote, masters of their own arms. And uh, militias weren't exactly favored under Oliver Cromwell, who had a quasi-dictatorship at the time, uh, when he had the protectorate that replaced the kings in this period. Uh, so they didn't want him uh, being able to centralize power under the new model army either. So there was this ongoing effort to get local civilly controlled militias that could uh, help the locals stand up to the centralized power. And uh, one of the, the great historians on this topic that I'll quote several times for this talk is a British historian named Marcus Cunliffe. And he has a book called uh, Soldiers and Civilians, and it's a history of mostly the United States and the relationship between civilians and the military in the U.S. It's now out of print, but if you can find it, it's very interesting if you're interested in this topic. Um, and uh, we'll go into some of how he describes the views of Americans in terms of how they favored service in militias over service in the, the, the permanent federal military. And that they, um, early Americans made a very big distinction between people who served in the local militia and people who served in the national military. But he notes also that it's, this goes back significantly uh, farther than just the American uh, Revolution. And he, he notes that uh, as, as the Cromwellian legacy died down at the end of the Civil Wars and as the, the Stuart kings came back, uh, who were now cured of their uh, pretensions toward absolutism, having been deposed and one of their heads cut off and all that. Uh, they were allowed to come back to the throne, and but the the liberals, the, the levelers and their allies weren't uh, weren't going to allow this new king to have a monopoly on military force. And so they did allow, as Cunliffe notes, a small milit small regular forces to be maintained for the military. This was the foundation of the, the modern British standing army. However, there was to be a nationwide militia composed of civilians who would, as in earlier days, be summoned in time of need. The militia, however, was to be under civil law and to be organized locally by the Lord Lieutenant in each county. It was thus decentralized and divorced from royal control. Unquote. And... Later American attitudes, Cunliffe explains, um, toward a standing army were adopted largely in this period. They inherited this, this thinking that to give the king or the executive power access to a, a, a permanent standing military force uh, on land basically gave the executive the power to uh, force the king's will on the local population. If any sort of group resisted, you would send in a military contingent and they would force the locals then to obey the executive power. And this, by the 18th century, had died down a little bit and the British had become a little more accepting of uh, standing militaries at that time. But the Americans, who were more in favor of, as we see just in general, had never quite abandoned the 17th century ideas that uh, uh, had come over with the earlier settlers um, had never be quite been abandoned. So in many ways, the Americans were more conservative and more siding with, uh, they were still more sympathetic to the old uh, liberal, radical liberal ideas that had arisen during the English Civil War. And so let's look at how this manifests itself then in the early years of the United States. Uh, the early years were marked not by the current constitution, but by uh, an earlier constitution. This is the so-called Articles of Confederation, uh, which came in uh, and was approved in the 1770s, uh, so more than a decade before uh, 1787, the current Constitution. And most of that document deals with arming in an army and a navy, because it, it imagined the United States is basically this defense uh, union that existed to defend it against European powers and such. Uh, the, the framers of the document were careful to allow states opportunities to veto federal actions, and uh, according to the text, it, it notes uh, and is very limiting upon how much the federal government can do in terms of waging war without agreement from the member states. So there are a variety of requirements in terms of buy-in from the member states in terms of waging any sort of war. However, it also goes on then to note that, quote, every state shall always keep up a well-regulated and disciplined militia sufficiently armed and accoutred and shall provide and constantly have ready for use in public stores a due number of filed pieces and tents, uh, 
and a proper quantity of arms, ammunition, and camp equipage. So, of course, you can start to see the beginnings of the text that later is incorporated into the Second Amendment here. And their concern, again, is making sure that the central government is not able to easily overwhelm the member states in terms of military power. And so by this time, uh, it's, it's, it's noting what's also an existing reality. The member states already had many of their own provisions, noting that the local population should be able to own arms. And they, all, of course, had a wide variety of local and member state militias. Why? Well, they needed them for a variety of reasons, right? They had, they had border disputes with, say, uh, the Spaniards in some cases. There were, of course, neighboring Indian tribes who might occasionally raid uh, the whites' communities as the whites pushed further and further into the frontier. This uh, cultivated more trouble uh, with the bordering tribes. And, of course, there was always some threat of some internal rebellion and disorder in general. And, of course, there was no police, right? Police, the idea of urban police is a 19th century innovation uh, and certainly didn't exist in 18th century America. And so it's keep in mind that when people are debating something like the Second Amendment, it's assumed as a given that these villages, that these farmers, that they're pretty much on their own. And they're going to require some sort of arms in order to defend themselves from any sort of renegades, marauders, highwaymen, Indian tribes, etc. And it's not. And so the Second Amendment was not written to really address that issue because that was just assumed to already be a part and parcel of every state constitution. And we can see that in the text later. And so we it's, it's important that we we don't look on the Second Amendment as something related to protecting yourself from crime or for hunting, right? Obviously has nothing to do with that. Uh, this is an attempt to balance military power and the monopolies, the potential monopolies on military power that existed. And you can see this in debates over the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. So as they're talking in 1787, 88 about should we adopt this new constitution, uh, some of them got up and said, well, you don't have to worry about U.S. centralized military power because you can assemble in Congress and then you can, you can tell the federal government to stop abusing your rights. Just assemble the people. And Patrick, Patrick Henry gets up at uh, the Virginia uh, discussion and debate over this, and he's very sarcastic about it. Uh, he, he, he doesn't believe the idea that you can just assemble the people and solve the problem. He thinks you need guns. He says, sir, we should have fine times indeed if to punish tyrants it were only necessary to assemble the people. Your arms wherewith you could defend yourselves are now gone. Did you ever read of any revolution in any nation brought about by the punishment of those in power inflicted by those who had no power at all? A federally controlled standing army we shall have also to execute the execrable commands of tyranny. And how are you to punish them? That is the tyrants. How will you order them to be punished? And who shall obey these orders? So Henry is rejecting the idea that, well, we'll just, we'll just call together Congress or we'll have some state legislatures meet and then we'll, we'll tell the tyrant to stop. What he's saying is, if you want to actually oppose tyrannical behavior, you're going to need to have guns to do so. And so this, of course, this attitude then uh, feeds very much into then in the 1780s and 90s in terms of our idea of what is the purpose of the Bill of Rights and what came to be known as the Second Amendment. And this, of course, is, came to be just common among liberals in general. That is the group we call classical liberals today, 19th century liberals, historical liberalism. Generally, the free market people, Thomas Jefferson, John Locke, those sorts of people. And what, something that characterized those groups, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom during this period, throughout the 18th and 19th century, was that the liberals opposed the idea of standing armies and uh, hated the idea and generally considered anything more than just a token force uh, of land troops was illegitimate and obviously a force for illiberal despotism. And that this goes on into the mid-19th, even the late 19th century in Britain even, among the radical liberals led by people like Richard Cobden who were very much against a standing army in any form. And they favored, of course, the, the more local militia system, the decentralized system that was being discussed here, and was, of course, preserved much better 
in the United States. It's, that idea is basically long gone in, in the modern United Kingdom. Uh, some remnants remain uh, in the United States. Uh, we see then uh, uh, expressed in some historians of the time, uh, and we can see Leon, or uh, historian Leon Friedman states it right here, quote, the people organized in the state militias were regarded as a counterforce against the threat that the regular army could be used as an instrument of oppression and service in the militia was a right of the citizen that could not be transgressed by the federal government. And that basically sums up the decentralist liberal view uh, at the time. And at the time when the new constitution was adopted, you ended up with a U.S. Army um, around, let's see, Congress opposed any attempts to increase the size of the professional U.S. Army much beyond a thousand men. Uh, that's, of course, stretched up and down the entire eastern seaboard. And that didn't grow much over the next several decades. By uh, the 1850s, uh, they used the army for all sorts of weird stuff, the regular army. It was mostly the militia they used. But one instance where they did use the army in the mid-19th century was when the Mormons uh, out in Utah refused to abandon a plural marriage, right? The multiple wives or one man. And for some reason, everyone back in Washington was really freaked out about this and felt something had to be done. So they send in an army contingent uh, to make them stop. Uh, yet using the standing army for just what the liberals had said they shouldn't be using it for. So President Buchanan sent in as many men as he could get together, and he sent in about 2,500 men uh, to Utah to do this. But that was a majority of the entire U.S. standing army at the time. So we're talking like three or 4,000 guys uh, that make up this army for North America. So you can see just how small uh, this force was by modern standards. Now, that was the, uh, that was the professional, full-time uh, U.S. military. And that was one thing. The balance of that was this, this unorganized and this localized militia. And, and what, does, what does that mean? How did they imagine that? And uh, they, they took many, many different forms. Um, George Mason, uh, one of the, uh, the framers of the Constitutional Convention, but one of the more libertarian ones, uh, he was asked, what, what is the militia? He says, they consist now of the whole people except for a few public officers. When the second Congress sought to exercise this constitutional authority to, quote, provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, it directed each and every free, able-bodied white male citizen of the respective states uh, who is of the age of 18 and under the age of 45 to enroll in the militia of their states. Or as Patrick Henley declared at the Virginia Ratifying Convention, the great object is that every man be armed. So is it just these guys who uh, are, are hanging out? Is there any sort of more organized uh, aspect of that? And that's not completely clear from the text, from the legal text we have. It's more clear from just historical experience that we get the clues about how people viewed this. From the text, it's quite clear that they had just some general idea that people should be able to own their own arms, either for uh, in case they're called out for the militia, or just for general use. And this goes back to before the Bill of Rights. And one of the clearest examples of this is the 1780 Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, which states that the people have a right to keep and bear arms for the common defense, quote unquote. Um, and it says, it even goes on, in times of peace, armies are dangerous to liberty. They ought not to be maintained without the consent of the, legis of the legislature. And the military power shall always be held in exact subordination to the civil authority and be governed by it. So this is 1780. This is uh, written years before the new constitution and the Bill of Rights is written. And many state constitutions contain these sorts of provisions. And we see this sort of thing crop up then in, late, in other state constitutions decades later. Uh, for example, if we look at the original constitutions for, say, Montana and Colorado, uh, so Colorado's constitution was 1876. Montana's was uh, probably about 10 years later, I think, maybe the 1880s. Uh, it's, these constitutions have very similar language, and they state that persons may keep and bear arms in defense of his home, person, and property, or in aid of the civil power, that is, for this, this unorganized militia. Or you can find other clauses in Arkansas's text that says, 
The citizens of this state shall have the right to keep and bear arms for their common defense. Maine's constitution says every, every citizen has a right to keep and bear arms for the common defense, and this right shall never be questioned. Kansas says the people have the right to bear arms for their defense and security, but the standing armies in times of peace are dangerous to liberty and shall not be tolerated, etc. So you get the idea. Uh, they weren't relying on the U.S. Federal Bill of Rights to set out the details of this. This was uh, heavily ingrained into the state constitutions themselves. And as is recognized by scholars today in many cases, the, the Federal Bill of Rights is based on state bills of rights, uh, that, that, that this, these ideas pre-exist um, the text as written there. However, there was this other tradition that we see in actual practice, which you don't necessarily get from the earlier comments in the 1780s, but it's clear that the thinking on this by the early 19th century was that, okay, well, we can also have these more institutionalized, permanent militia groups controlled by state and local governments, or at least licensed by them, in a sense. They were semi-private in many ways, and they, were, they have a quite interesting history. Uh, Jeffrey Rogers Hummel, who's written a great journal article on a conscription and the militias in the United States, uh, he says that uh, there were certainly plenty of or, or unorganized militia groups, um, but some of these militia groups uh, made themselves permanent. They became essentially clubs, and they met all the time, and they trained, and they became de facto private militias in many cases because they funded themselves uh, with essentially a license from the state or local government, a charter of sorts. And uh, it was unclear exactly what level of readiness was to be expected from these groups, uh, but these people made themselves available, and it was known to where you could go to get these uh, militia guys to turn out uh, in case of civil unrest, in case of uh, attack from neighboring tribes, that sort of thing. Uh, and this was not to be confused with the idea of today's National Guard which is a, a federally controlled and federally funded force, um, which is subordinate in times of, uh, in times of emergency, federal uh, officers and federal officials take control of these state National Guard groups. And that's totally different. Now, they did discuss that sort of thing at the time of the founders. But as one legal scholar notes, yes, the founders had a concept that approximates today's National Guard but it was a concept of which they disapproved. This was the select militia, a specially trained part of the citizenry. To the founders, a select militia was little better than an army. The Philadelphia Convention explicitly rejected a proposal to create a select militia for the federal government, as did the Third Congress. And also, moreover, this idea that, they, that the federal government would just, quote-unquote, provide for training the militia was seen as totally unacceptable because it was, they feared that, okay, if the feds train and fund these state militias, they end up running these state militias and they end up working for the federal government. So that doesn't accomplish the end, which was to have militias totally separate from the federal government. Now, this took the form of uh, states funding their own militias, and being jealous of their ability to control the use of those militias. And we can look to a variety of cases where the federal government attempted to, quote-unquote, call forth the militia. That is, the president declares there's some sort of emergency or a war, and he tells the states to send us your militia troops, and we'll fight the war with them. The idea, of course, was that if the executive power wanted to wage a war, they were going to have to ask nicely for the states to give them their, their militiamen so that they could fight in the war. And that, that had an ingrained veto of sorts, right, where the state government could potentially refuse to send those troops if the state government did not approve because the state essentially funded it and controlled these local groups. So you had to ask, you know, pretty please send us your militias so that we can fight this war. And it was early on in the War of 1812 that they already started to meet resistance from this. Uh, for example, Vermont, uh, the governor of Vermont, Martin Chittenden, uh, he very much opposed the use of Vermont troops in the war, what was essentially ended up being a campaign to invade Canada. He said that, look, our state troops are here to defend the state from incursion and invasion from foreigners. My troops are not here to invade Canada and to basically start wars with other countries. 
Uh, so he, he, had, he stood up to the feds and was very vehement about, you don't get to use my troops. Uh, the governor of Connecticut also refused to comply with a requisition uh, from the Secretary of War at the time. And on this, the state assembly backed him up, it, saying that it is not only intolerably oppressive, but subversive to the rights and liberties of the state and the freedom, sovereignty, and independence of the same and inconsistent with the principles of the Constitution of the United States. So they had these troops that were sitting there and they're like, these troops are for defending Connecticut. You don't get to use. So too bad. And during the Civil War, another case of this came up where Lincoln uh, wanted to use troops out of Kentucky, which was a border state and had not actually seceded. And he attempted to call forth the troops from Kentucky and Kentucky refused, uh, saying that, well, we don't want to secede and we're not favoring secession among the southern states, but we're also not going to participate in shooting our fellow citizens in these southern states. And so you don't get to use our troops. And uh, he sa- as the governor claimed, uh, we save the union and frown down secession. Was, was their idea, that they could take this middle ground and they weren't going to let anyone use their troops for it. And, and one observer uh, <laughs> said, he said, if a, a foreigner came to the country, uh, that he would be bewildered and, and he might well have concluded that the United States had become three countries, the Union, the Confederacy, and Kentucky, because Kentucky just refused to take sides in this. And part of refusing to help the federal government put down this rebellion was to refuse its use of the state troops. Now, that ended in Lincoln's favor because eventually they had an election and a bunch of union people came into power in the Kentucky state government. Um, And so that allowed Lincoln then to uh, use those troops. But it did not establish any sort of legal precedent saying that, uh, yes, the president gets to use these troops in any way he wants and you have to submit them. That was not established. he simply managed to win an election and uh, at the state level and get the troops that way. So w- we can see then how that was working as intended then, uh, because, of course, in, during the Civil War, if Lincoln had not been able to call forth state troops in that way, he would have not been able to wage a war nearly to the degree that he had. Now, in that case, though, most of the state governors, most of the state legislatures were in agreement with the federal government's policy, at least in the north. And so they agreed to send their troops. Kentucky was the outlier. But that was a voluntary submission of troops. Um, later, the, the Fed started to use a, a federal conscription method, and there were other methods used as, the time, as time went on. But early on, the war relied heavily on states voluntarily sending in their troops. And they were able to do that because of agreement, because there was a consensus in his favor among the northern states. But he wasn't able to force or compel the states to send in their troops this way. So, what did these local militias look like in many cases? Uh, Let's look at the 19th century and and to get a sense of what was going on here. And first of all, it's very interesting to note how there were differences in views between federal troops, federal professional troops, and these, these militia troops that were viewed as a good thing But people took a very dim view of federal troops at this time. And this will be remarkable for younger people who have grown up in a time, uh, although maybe uh, the younger among you don't even remember these days, during the the Iraq War after 2003 and 9-11, people were everywhere putting like magnets on their car saying, I support the troops, and you're supposed to start saying, thank you for your service all the time. Uh, which wasn't really a thing in the 80s uh, or even really the 90s. It was kind of a post-9-11 thing. We thank the troops for everything all the time. Um, And we announce it on our our bumper stickers and and that sort of thing. That would have not been your dominant attitude uh, in in regards to the federal government uh, and their troops in the 19th century. And a lot of this is covered by Cunliffe uh, in his book, where he's got all sorts of great little... um, uh, little anecdotes about it. And he's t- he, he takes a line from Ulysses S. Grant, Union soldier, uh, talking about uh, the first time he got his, his uniform and he went into town and he was very, very proud. And he's a, he's a professional federal soldier. And so they see him in uniform and they know. And he says, I donned the uniform and set off for Cincinnati on horseback while I was imagining that everyone was looking at me and admiring him. A little urchin, bareheaded, barefooted, with dirty and ragged pants, 
turned to me and said, Soldier, will you work? No siree. This attitude, Richard Bruce Winders explains in his History of James A. Polk, quote, illustrates the image of soldiers common in the 1840s as slackers on the public dole, unquote. Indeed, even as late as 1891, a speech published in the Christian journal The Churchman recounted Grant's anecdote and concluded that, quote, the national contempt for the army was based on the fact that, quote, it is such a lazy life, unquote. Nor did the attitudes begin in the 1840s. In his biography of George Washington, uh, historian Mason Weems notes the lack of concern over American casualties suffered under Anthony Wayne in a battle with the Shawnee in 1794, writing, however, after the first shock of the battle, the loss of these poor federal soldiers, uh, these poor souls, was not much lamented. Tall young fellows who could easily get their half dollar a day at the healthful and glorious labor of the plow, that these men would go and enlist and rust among the lice and itch of a camp for four dollars a month were certainly not worth their country's crying about, unquote. So you can imagine people reacting that way to a uh, to U.S. casualties um, in, uh, in current culture. Uh, but in the 19th century, uh, there was uh, much disdain for the permanent federal troops in this way. Now, they did not feel that way among militia troops, uh, the state troops, the local troops of which many Americans were members. They had quite a different view. The part-time soldier was viewed as something far more respectable and glorious and hardworking because, of course, he was a farmer most of the time and then in his spare time would go train and and volunteer service uh, to his community. And uh, the the, the idea of the standing army thus persisted well into the 19th century. And so there were a lot of policies designed to encourage and protect local militias in this way. Um, And we can look and see how uh, some of these really took form. And let's look at some of the details here that I think we can, uh, let's see. I want to provide you with some of these uh, pictures of of what these, uh, these local militias looked like. All right, here we go. Here's some good details. Uh, by, by the... End of the 18th century, we begin to see more and more semi-private militias. These were alongside the common militia, that is, uh, what in many cases were conscripts at the state level, um, which were far more used in the very early 19th century and the late 18th century, where there was forced uh, military service in many states. A common belief among Americans is that there wasn't a draft uh, until the Civil War, but that's not true. There was draft for the state troops at the local level, going back even to uh, the revolution. But that actually died out, at least uh, in the Midwest and North, by the mid-19th century. They still had conscripted troops in the South because they had forced people to do uh, slave patrols. Uh, but in the North, they didn't care about that. And they, uh, they basically got rid of the common militia that had conscription. And it just became that the militia became dominated by these semi-private groups that were generally chartered at the state and local level. And they were often called the uniform militia because they had to buy their own uniforms, Uh, often very extravagant, beautiful uniforms uh, in many cases. They were independent of a centralized state militia system, even in many cases, just simply had uh, some letter of approval from the state legislature for what they can do. They elected their own officers, were self-funded and trained on their own schedules. Although they were ostensibly commanded by the state governors, this system of functionally private militias became an established part of daily life for many Americans. These were local volunteer militias with names like the Richardson Light Guard, the Detroit Light Guard, or the Asmonian Guard. They were essentially private clubs composed of gun owners who were expected to assist in keeping law and order within the cities and towns of the United States. Separate from the so-called common militias, uh, which, as we've stated, were were more official and, and often had a conscription element. By the Jacksonian period, however, the, these, these volunteer militias were really the dominant group, and they saw a remarkable growth in, uh, in the mid-19th century. Uh, the number of volunteer units had been expanding since the American Revolution, but after the War of 1812, it exploded. 300 sprang up in California alone between 1849 and 1846. 
uh, these groups were, in the words of Martin of Marcus Cunliffe, volunteer companies existing independently of the statewide system of militia, and they held themselves aloof from the common mass. They provided their own uniforms, um, and so you could you could see that in many cases. They would simply write a letter off to the state government. Hey, we got a bunch of guys here. We want to form a, a, a local militia. And uh, someone would write back from the state and say, sound good, but you're on your own. You got to fund yourself. But we'll add you to the list of people that the governor will call upon in case uh, of need. And since, of course, it wasn't funded by the state, then it was basically a, a large local independent operation. Uh, but you can look at the way some of these units came about. Uh, and the way they were funded, if we look at, say, the Richardson Light Guard, uh, which comes from South Reading, uh, Massachusetts, um, in response to a perceived shortage of militiamen in the years following the Mexican War, at the time, all that was necessary for the militia to be regarded as legally sanctioned was the group to petition the governor. And the dues could be expensive, however, uh, so they would go to fundraisers and they would offer honorary uh, to funders and they would offer honorary memberships in these militias in exchange for money. And what happened with the Richardson Light Guard uh, is uh, the largest donor in that case was a man named Richardson, after whom the militia ended up being named. So funding from prominent community members also added legitimacy to the group and ensured it would continue to be regarded as a community sanctioned group of armed men. They were enmeshed very much in the community, right? The modern idea of militias as came about in the, the 90s and the last 20 years is that you have these malcontents who are off meeting in the, uh, the, the forest somewhere and they're all plotting some kind of revolution and maybe they're white supremacists or something. Uh, the, these militia groups were like the mayor and state legislators and your local business leaders and your local rich guys who are funding the group. Um, by the way, I don't necessarily think that image of the modern militia is correct, but that is a dominant uh, feeling about how they should be described and certainly how they're described by uh, left-wing scholars on the topic. Uh, but you can't get much more establishment than these militias in the 19th century in terms of funding, in terms of who's in them, in terms of the, uh, the approval they get from the state and local government. Uh, but they have no tie whatsoever to the federal government. Uh, they don't get funding. They don't, they don't take any sort of oath to the federal government. And it's just simply not a significant issue for them. And so a lot of these, uh, <laughs> a lot of these groups, um, they become really institutions for integrating people into just United States society uh, overall. And even in this period... Uh, they were taking on, as, as well, arms became more affordable to middle-class Americans, they became more common and just kind of more middle-class in feel, uh, less uh, associated with the upper classes because that's who could afford guns in the early years. But by the 1840s and 50s, regular people could go out and buy some pretty decent guns. They're forming their own groups, and they're giving themselves names like softball teams. So some of these militias, they call themselves the Invincibles, the Avengers, the Snake Hunters. They have names like this. And a lot of them were made up of uh, a lot of immigrants. <laughs> this is a point that Cun Cunliffe uh, makes, is uh, because of their local nature, many militias reflected uh, local character as well. And access was hardly limited to national ethnic majorities. By the 1850s, immigrants had come to dominate many volunteer militias, with Irish, Scottish, and German militias becoming especially common. The Scottish militiamen wore kilts as part of their parade uniforms, the Italians created a Guardia Nazionale Italiana. Robert Ernst notes that the significance of the immigrant military companies is evident in the fact that in 1853, more than 4,000 of the 6,000 uniform militia in New York City were of foreign birth. Uh, it would be interesting to see if a bunch of Venezuelans got together and formed up a, a militia today in New York City, how that would uh, be received. Uh, but of course, it, in this setting... Setting up a militia integrates you into the essentially the ruling class. It creates a, a way of social advancement. It creates a way of of regularizing yourself, of announcing that we're middle class and and uh, we're we're part of this society and we're part of its its legal system essentially. 
Uh, nor were militia groups limited to Christians. Jack D. Foner recounts in the American Jewish Archives Journal, Jews in New York City formed military companies of their own. Troop K, Empire Hussars, was composed entirely of Jews, as was the Young Men's Lafayette Association. A third unit, the Asmonian Guard, consisted of both Jewish and Christian employees of the Asmonian, one of the earliest Anglo-Jewish weekly newspapers. Our employees commented the newspaper have been seized with this military mania as they have enrolled themselves into an independent corps, unquote. And uh, we, to this day, there are some surviving aspects of these groups. As part of this, a lot of local military schools and institutions cropped up where you could send the youth that would become integrated into the idea of the local militia, local military, and uh, a lot of even the existing uh, military schools today, that was their original, uh, their, their origins was in preparing for local uh, militia and military type service. And uh, that's where we get the marching bands from, right? I mean, on college campuses, they, they have these military-esque uniforms, right? All of these uh, militia groups, they had their own marching bands, their own uh, musical detachments. They, they were always doing local parades and events, and firemen had their own militia groups. The police had their own militia groups. And it, it was just this whole milieu of all of these groups that uh, were there and were very much at the forefront of really today what you would look at like the Knights of Columbus and the Elks Club and the Rotary Club and all that sort of stuff. They all had the the military branch of the Rotary Club was the thing and the, the military branch of the Optimist Club, right? This, this was basically how it was structured. And so how, this, if you're like one of these extreme decentralist types and you're like, yes, we want, we want there to be a very robust military culture out of reach of the military, of the central federal military, this sounds like a really great situation. Um, cause you can imagine then like how much power monopoly does the federal government have where cities are filled with these independent militia groups that answer only to the city or to the state. Uh, it did not survive really much beyond the American Civil War. So its heyday was in the mid-19th century and survived a bit into the late 19th century. Uh, but the, the, the fact of the Civil War brought about a standardization in military use and military strength that uh, relied much, much more than on federally controlled troops they had, of course, experimented then with a, a federal uh, conscription act at this point. They had called forth all of the state militia groups that had then been federalized and gotten used to being under the command of federal soldiers. And then you had all of these veterans, huge numbers of veterans after the war, who began to associate themselves with military service in service of the federal government. So this really changed the tenor, the military tenor of the country in terms of what is the military, who serves in it, what's the... This, this whole idea where they had all this contempt for federal soldiers, that largely died out because of the prestige of veterans after the American Civil War. And so that then led into what we now find is recognizable and what we're told is actually the militia system in the United States. And this was, uh, this can be traced really to a specific piece of legislation, 1902, called the Dick Act. Uh, or the Militia Act of 1982. This brought this final realization of having this professional, trained state militia system that was essentially under the federal control and could be easily called forth by the feds and turned into a federal, tr uh, a, a federal group. So ostensibly, it looked like a state militia, but it wasn't, uh, because it was increasingly uh, under the command of federal troops. It was funded by... Uh, the federal government. And yes, after 1903, the National Guard still had a high degree of allegiance to the state, but the National Defense Act of 1916 uh, allowed the National Guard uh, to be deployed outside their own states. So it was chipping away this old idea from Kentucky and Connecticut, uh, where, okay, we, these, these troops are here to defend our state. Uh, nope, no longer. We couldn't after 1916, we can move National Guard around anywhere we want. And then after 1933, uh, new amendments to the National Defense Act were passed, which made members of the National Guard units 
members of both their state's National Guard and the federal military. So they started taking oaths to both their state and to the federal military and were considered employees, essentially, or troops of both. And so by 1970, this was pretty much all gone. Now, if you're old enough to remember the Vietnam War, uh, you'll remember that in many cases, men avoided service in Vietnam by joining their National Guards. And uh, this was a common use tactic by some of the, uh, the guys who were fast thinking because you had to get in early in the conflict in order to do this. But if you saw the war coming, you could then enlist in your state's National Guard, put in your time in the National Guard, and then once you were released from the National Guard, it was considered you had done your military service and you couldn't be drafted at that point. You'd already done your bit. And so this was a common tactic in California. I know some people who did that. Uh, I know people who joined the Texas National Guard uh, to avoid being shipped off to Vietnam because at the time it was still written into the law that state National Guards could not be stationed overseas uh, and also that the governors would maintain a veto on the use of these troops anyway. And so that continued for a period, and that wasn't changed until after the war. And so in the 70s and 80s, then you saw, you saw a continued movement toward bringing them under federal control. And the, the final nail in the coffin then was what I call in here the, the governor's re revolt of 1986. So Vietnam War is over. Uh, you can, there was still a perceived veto that state governments had over the deployment of state troops, the state National Guard troops. But in the heat of the Cold War, uh, some military conservative Cold Warrior types, uh, specifically a guy named uh, Sonny Montgomery from Mississippi, decided he didn't like this idea that state governors were uh, stepping in to avoid and stepping in to prevent the president from sending troops to Central America. There was, this was a very heated topic at the time where they were sending American National Guard troops to Central America to train troops there, many of which were troops of these despotic regimes in Central America at the time. So a lot of left-wing governors, they didn't want their troops being shipped off to Central America to do this. And so this cold warrior guy, Montgomery, is like, well, we can't let that happen. Wherever the president says troops should go, they should go. So... Uh, they passed new legislation in 1986, uh, finally eliminating the last vestiges of state veto on the use of National Guard troops. And uh, that then, that was that. And that's how you have today this situation where you probably maybe know some people who have been in a National Guard unit, and then they're just minding their own business, working at their regular job, they're in the National Guard. Next thing they know, they get a call that they're being deployed to Afghanistan or they've got a training stint coming up in Indonesia. Well, that would have been unimaginable, of course, in the 19th century that you could send National Guard troops to a foreign country, uh, and especially with a war not being declared, and the idea that they could be called up and sent to anywhere at any time. So this was totally contrary to the idea of the Second Amendment, totally contrary to the idea of state-controlled uh, militias and military power, and that the idea that they could counterbalance federal power, that was just clearly all gone. And today we see that in the fact that essentially the National Guard is just the Army Reserves. It's a reserve force that gets called up and sent to wherever the president wants to have a war. And there is no counterbalancing anymore. There's no real uh, issue here where the state National Guard could offer any sort of resistance against federalization of those troops and the use of those troops in a federal effort. They're funded by the federal government. They're in the chain of command of the federal government. And unless the law is significantly changed, that's going to remain the situation. Now, historically, in 1986, the governors tried to go against that and start announcing that Okay, well, now you've made it law that you can use uh, these troops whenever you want, but we're not going to let you, we're, we're going to somehow stand up for ourselves and we're going to resist even if it's just quasi-legal. Well, the, the, the Defense Department immediately responds, and even though they were unwilling to push the issue of you have to do what you say, what they did was they said, if you refuse to use the National Guard in the way we say you must, we're refusing, we're withdrawing all federal military funding from your state. So, of course, the federal government, they put lots of money into army bases, into army equipment. They pay army salaries in these states. And any time a state since the 80s has attempted to resist the deployment of state troops for federal purposes, the, uh, the Pentagon sends in generals. 
and threatens local politicians and says, uh, we'll make you, we'll, we will inflict as much pain as possible on you for attempting to control your use of state troops. And you see this today and the same reaction in legislation that's uh, now used in a variety of state legislatures. It's come up several years now, the last five years or so, where various states, they have what's called defend the guard legislation. And this is an attempt to assert some state control back over the guard. Normally, the way the bill is written is that you cannot deploy any of our state troops unless Congress has actually declared war on the relevant country in question. So the only way you would then be able to deploy U.S. troops to Indonesia, to Afghanistan, would be for Congress to formally declare war on those countries, which Congress never does anymore. Uh, so this was a, an attempt then to really rein in federal power over state troops. It hasn't passed in any, in any legislature, largely for the reasons that uh, attempts to control the Guard failed in the 80s, is that Pentagon comes in and they start saying, think of all the jobs you'll lose. Think of all the money we'll withdraw from your state. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure that you don't get reelected. We'll, we'll point out all of the money you've cost your state uh, through uh, your attempt to veto federal power on this. And so that's where we are now. And so you'll still, claim, you'll still hear people claim, oh, well, the militia system exists. It's the National Guard system, which it's not at all. The, the National Guard system is nothing even remotely, uh, has no resemblance to what was imagined when they talk about militias in the Second Amendment and this idea that militias are necessary to the preservation of a free state. When they're talking about that, they're talking about a decentralized military force controlled only by the state and locals and outside the reach of the federal government. And that was their idea. That was their plan. That was the way it was supposed to work. And that's the fundamental idea behind the Second Amendment, was that it was about decentralizing the coercive power of the state. But that has failed. And so now you do have these state militias, but they don't function as intended uh, at all. So in order to recapture the essence of what the Second Amendment was supposed to be, you would have to return to something like you saw in the 19th century with these state and local chartered groups that are not funded by the feds and truly independent in terms of who they answer to. Um, and uh, so it would be nice to see some progress in that direction, but I'm not hopeful at the moment. I don't see any real uh, concerted efforts to accomplish that right now. Um, so uh, that's all I have to say about this topic. I just find that people generally, they don't know where the National Guard comes from or really what is the philosophy underlying the Second Amendment and, and, as regards that, that militia clause there. Why is that there? Um, hopefully this has given you some information that uh, 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 clears up some misconceptions on that. So thank you very much. I don't know if you have any questions. Hang on. So, obviously, I'm pro-Second Amendment. I believe it's there for uh, the common defense. Uh, no restrictions on any type of firearm. However, my issue with the argument for the Second Amendment is, obviously, I can say, yes, we should be able to own anything from pistols to machine guns to tanks. However, even when I've heard um, the argument for this, I have a hard time rationalizing where does it stop? Because eventually the argument goes all the way up to atomic weapons. Right. So what is the counter argument to saying people should not own atomic weapons while staying consistent with the argument for the Second Amendment? So in terms of the Second Amendment as positive law, right, how is it imagined to function as law? The, the Second Amendment was written to limit the federal government only on this. So their answer then, the people who wrote the amendment would have said, this is just here to prevent the federal government from regulating any of those arms, right? So imagine an 18th century where atomic weapons exist, or, you know, we're in a alternate universe. And so someone's saying, well, what about the second amendment? Why doesn't it limit atomic weapons? Their answer would have been, that's for the state governments to debate and limit our job is just to ensure that this amendment doesn't in any way interfere with the state's ability to raise militias uh, 
and to to arm their citizens in a way that will defend those states against uh, federal dominance. And so they imagine, and not just in guns, but they're, the way they imagined the, the Constitution at the time is that uh, the heavy lifting on all of this stuff would be done by state constitutions and state bills of rights. And so they would have said, oh, you want to know what needs to be limited in terms of, you know, from, from knives to atomic weapons, what is legal in this sense? They would say, go to the state constitutions and fight it out there. And so if we are talking about the Second Amendment, that's the easy out, which is that, okay, this is just here to keep the federal government off the backs of the state governments. Now, that doesn't save us the question of, okay, well, what is legal at the state constitutional level? What should the, 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 uh, the states limit there? Uh, there's no clear line there. You will talk to diehard anarcho-capitalist type libertarians who have some fairly sophisticated arguments about how in a totally private society uh, where, for example, most people rely on, say, uh, insurance or covenant communities to protect their rights, that those covenant communities would not permit their residents to have nuclear arms because of the potential for destroying the entire community, right? So in a, a totally private system where there was no state power, uh, where all all government and coercive power was by contractual agreement, theoretically, that it would be something akin to, okay, in order to live in this location, you can only arm yourself with these sorts of weapons. And we won't allow you to have nuclear weapons because of the potential for disaster and that sort of thing. So you could potentially have a totally private society that would still limit those weapons for the same reason that you would have local governments want to limit atomic weapons as well. So it would seem that if you wanted to apply some kind of objective measure to it, it would have to just be, I think, proportional to the potential for unintentional or massive harm uh, just based on mistakes, uh, based on just one single person being able to act alone and inflict massive damage. And that's probably what the debate would mostly be over. Uh, but when, of course, when we're talking about the Second Amendment, we don't have to worry about it any of that, because that wasn't its intention, was to limit that. We'll let the state governments do that. I know that in like places like Switzerland, where every citizen is armed and has a gun, they have like the lowest crime rate. So wouldn't it benefit America to maybe do the same because it would be less likely for someone to go out there and commit a crime if they know that their neighbor is going to be able to defend themselves against that. Well, part of the reason that, well, there's a couple of things going on in Switzerland. Um, I don't know that I would attribute their low crime rate to the high uh, gun ownership rate, just because all the surrounding countries have very low crime rates as well, and they have much less gun ownership. Um, so the correlation isn't totally clear there. Um, obviously, I favor the, the, the fondness for private weapons ownership in Switzerland. I think that's good. They have a whole culture around that, where, like shooting is the national pastime. Uh, however, a big reason for widespread gun ownership in Switzerland is because everybody serves in the militia. So all of the people who have uh, legal access to the full-blown machine guns and such, these are people who have, uh, have performed their military service through uh, their local militia or through the, the Swiss army. Um, and so we would be, imagine this, uh, imagine a similar situation here, right? Where and we, we talked about this at dinner a little bit. Imagine if the uh, the U.S. National Guard functioned in a way that the Swiss National Guard works. Right, all of these people are required to do a year of service. And I'm opposed to the draft, by the way. But if you're going to do it, the Swiss way is a less objectionable way to do it. They you're expected to unless you want to pay an extra tax, you have to give your year of military service. Well, of course, those those Swiss troops they're not deployed to Asia. They're not deployed to Afghanistan. They're in Switzerland learning how to defend Switzerland. And so all of these people, they go through this and, and they're part of this group socially. And of course, uh, service in the Swiss military brings with it certain social benefits and such. And all those people have real military training and they know how to use these machine guns uh, that they've got. And in fact, up until the 1960s, the right to vote in Switzerland was connected to 
your uh, your military service, which was then, of course, connected to your ownership of arms. And there was very much uh, a established connection between all of this, that citizenship and military service and voting was all kind of in this bundle. So you can imagine if the United States did something similar to that, where the National Guard did not send its troops to the other side of the planet, where if you signed up for the Oklahoma National Guard, you knew that all of your service was going to take place in Oklahoma. Uh, in lieu of invasion from a foreign force. So you were going to be near your family. You weren't going to be shipped off for months at a time. And you were going to serve with also other people in your community, your neighbors. You could see how that would have a very important social function. It would build social cohesion. It would also ensure that people who have guns know how to use them safely and properly and would just have a variety of benefits. Uh, but And you would also probably get much more enrollment. Right. People would probably much more readily enlist in that if I know I'm not going to be sent off to Iraq. Uh, But I know that I might be sent down the road to do some training with my neighbors and to defend my home state in the process. You could see how that would be much more appealing to a much larger number of Americans. And I get to shoot guns and stuff and like bomb things and watch things blow up. Lots of young men like this sort of thing. Right. And many people do join the National Military because they like that. They like the bombs and the explosions and the guns and all that stuff. But they end up signing up for the the National Military. The next thing they know, they're shipped off to some country where they don't even know why they're there. And so you could see how this would be a very different sort of dynamic if the state militia functioned in a different way. But as we have it, it doesn't work that way at all. Um, I wish it was more like the Swiss system. Uh, unfortunately, it is not. I do think the fact that there's all this Swiss gun ownership is is for the best, but I don't think that's the reason for uh, for the low crime, um, just because that's the European experience in general. Um, but yeah, I uh, yay Switzerland. I mean, I think they do a lot of things right, and then that's probably good. So first, I can perhaps get along with the des- uh, decentralization decentralization of the militia or the military onto a certain level. I see, me personally, uh, the issue that I see once we get to such a local level uh, can be exemplified uh, by this example, which I'm glad you actually brought up the Mormons in Utah and that example there. However, I would like to kind of go back still with the Mormons, but to Missouri and the executive order that was proposed at the time that would uh, that basically called for the elimination and extermination of the Mormons while they were in Missouri. So my concern is that when we start going to such a localized level, especially given our polarized time today, if we are per se to con- if if we are trying to propose uh, legislation to change the way we do things to a more localized level, that there will be a conflict of ideologies uh, that could perhaps take you have per se let's take the Lions Club and you have some other club who disagree with each other on some ideological belief system in some state. Could we perhaps see that without a per se the state or a some higher intervention of whatever it may be, even if you per se God or whoever it is, some higher intervention that comes in to say to bring some sort of peace deal, so we don't have such conflict of interest and conflict of uh, conflict of ideologies like we did in the Missouri example I provided with the Mormons who were all coming in and saw Zion being in Missouri and the local people there, local militias, militias appointed by the state as well, all getting involved to exterminate a different religious uh, belief system. Well, you see that in non use, use of non-militias too, um, right? You don't need a militia for the state government to employ its coercive power against certain groups. Uh, we could point to, for example, the use of the Texas Rangers against Mexican-Americans during the Mexican Revolution. There was... There was a lot of uh, lynching going on at the hands of the Texas Rangers uh, in 1916 um, because of a, uh, a perceived race war that uh, Mexican revolutionaries were supposedly starting. And you had, interestingly in that case, you had the Mexican-Americans fleeing the state troops and trying to get into Fort Bliss in El Paso to escape the state. Uh, the state government, hoping that the federal government, which is more indifferent to them, uh, might uh, might protect them that way. And so, yes, what you do want is a level of decentralization where you can escape. And that was, I think, their main concern, was that we need some sort of, rather than a large, unified federal force from which there is no escape uh, and which faces no serious opposition from within the borders of the United States, uh, 
we need something here that would provide some sort of pushback and help them provide an alternative force that people could retreat to and find some shelter in. And sometimes that has worked in favor of, like, in the case of 1916, where they escaped what were essentially state troops, uh, hoping to find some shelter with the federal troops. But the larger concern was that the federal government, so much larger and so much wealth, so much better funded, was that there was no escape unless there was a countervailing force at the state and local level. And I mean, you're just, a conflict is to be assumed in cases like that. What you're trying to do is localize the conflict as much as possible and try and provide opportunities for people to at least move out of harm's way. So you could at least leave the state of Missouri and find some safety that way. And I mean, that's what the Mormons got real good at, right? It was moving around to escape whatever Illinois, Missouri, whatever the local officials were trying to do there. That's why they went out to the middle of nowhere in Utah. Um, where they still couldn't escape. Uh, But then they sent the federal troops. So that proved, right, they thought they were escaping the Missouri troops, and then lo and behold, they sent the federal troops out all the way to Utah. At least you knew Missouri wasn't going to send Missouri troops to Utah. So you could at least be, you could at least escape that group. Uh, So the the idea that they had, that these liberals had in the 18th century, was that you're never going to be able to fully escape conflict. There's always going to be elites that are fighting against other elites and attempting to exert power in ways among themselves and against people that they can get away with oppressing, what they were trying to do was set up some sort of obstacle that would prevent these elites from fully exercising their full power. And so that's the vision here. Um, but I, it's hard to imagine a case where you can truly nip in the bud any sorts of conflict that might arise. And that's just... Just any time you have political power at stake, right, there's, people are going to abuse it and they're going to try and use it against you. Uh, and the liberal view is that if at least it is localized and you have many choices where you can move across borders to get to a different legal regime, that's preferable to just having a unitary government. But it doesn't work perfectly by any means, that's for sure. And that's recognized. So almost a year ago today, the the House in Maine advanced legislation that would uh, ban paramilitary paramilitary training in the state, um, and then it would, it would have to pass the Senate. Um, if if it does pass, that would make it the twenty seventh state to ban this type of training, which is kind of concerning because that encompasses over half the states in the United States that currently ban this type of uh, paramilitary training. Um, you, you kind of touched on the reasons why the the nineteenth century model of militias fell out of out of popularity from um, historical phenomena such as like the Civil War and dependence on federal funding. Uh, but now we also kind of have this obstacle of there's actually legislation that bans this type of training. Keeping this in mind, I mean, we have these these popularity principles, but also now this legislation um, poses significant obstacles. Do you think that a path back to the principles of the 19th century militia exists today? Well, it would certainly require a change in ideology, right? People have come so far away from uh, that level of civic, civic engagement um, to that relationship with firearms. Remember, people just grew up around firearms all the time. Like nine-year-old boys are running. There's a great book uh, called The Virgin Vote, referring to your virgin vote in those days was uh, your first vote that you cast at age 21, this is a history book by a guy named John Grinspan. And it, uh, the book's about youth culture in the 19th century in this period that we're talking about. And he was talking about what it meant to be a, a young person growing up in that time period. And just your average middle-class person just went around shooting things, like small animals all the time. There was a familiarity with it, and it wasn't viewed in the way that it's viewed now. Uh, you would have to recapture something like like the Swiss idea of shooting as a national pastime, I think, to get people to be less afraid of the idea. And then on an institutional level, you could probably then, if you could convince state governments to be more proactive in terms of funding uh, and chartering their own real state militia groups, that this has a this has our approval and you're going to get proper training and you're going to be supervised so that you know that the people who come out of these state militias 
that uh, true state militias, not the National Guard, you come out of them and you have some level of training and you've, you've undergone the background checks and you've been integrated into the community and you're considered a safe person, like you're supposed to believe about police officers today, uh, that if you could imbue these institutions with some sort of uh, state imprimatur of sorts, that I think then you could start to reclaim that idea. Um, but there's, of course, no interest at the state level for creating those sorts of institutions or that sort of institutional approval. A state could do that. I don't see any reason why not. Um, they would have to cough up some funding uh, to make that possible, which most of them don't want to do. Some of the larger states do have uh, state defense forces that aren't the National Guard and are professional military uh, detachments that answer just to the state government. Florida has one. California has one. Uh, but that they don't do a whole lot of training. They they're mostly aging military people who already got their training and and that, and they're not heavily funded. Uh, but it's it's legal. The states could do it, but they're going in the opposite direction because they're banning any sort of of locally funded military. I don't I don't hold out much hope for something like the Asmonean Guard or the Snake Hunters or the Invincibles coming about anytime soon, where it's just a a local group. Uh, but if, if the state came out and said, okay, this group is fine, I could see people getting behind a, uh, uh, a military auxiliary of the fire department. Um, I mean, firemen, they're revered, basically, in this country still. You might be able to convince people that that was okay. Look at these fine, upstanding firemen. They sacrifice themselves for our community, and also they're, they're a ready-made militia group to come to spring to the public defense. Maybe that would be a good starting place. Um, but uh, I have yet to see any state legislation that's trending in that direction. Um, but I think it would be good if it did. <laughs>